watching Notes and Nine. Hello, and welcome to Notes and Nine. I'm David Leedy. Episode 181, Accelerator Event Listeners. And now for a daily special. Okay, well, it's that time of year again when you can nominate uh, somebody to be an IBM champion. Uh, the nominations are open. As I film this, it's uh, it's September 14th or 15th, and I think the nominations are open until sometime in October. Um, here's a link uh, for you to go to. And what is an IBM champion? It's, it's just a person who helps you helps others, does something positive with IBM software or services or things like that. Now, I've been honored to be an IBM champion since they started in 2009, and it's a great group of people. Uh, there's been a lot of other champions out there. I stole uh, this graphic from Carl Henry, uh, who's another IBM champion this year. Um, so there's a lot of people in this community uh, and around these products and, and, and services that try to help other people. Um, so what I would suggest you do is if you find a blogger, especially someone new, because it doesn't always have to be the same old people. And, and if, if I am a champion again, great. If not, it's not really that big a deal to me because I'm just a customer and, and I'm going to do this stuff anyway. So I, I would encourage you to find somebody new to nominate. I might have some suggestions in a future blog post or, or show. Um, but speaking of champions, um, we have a recurring champion today and a returning one, uh, and that's John Jardine from South Africa, and he's been a champion for a while, and he's he's not only specializes in X-Pages, uh, he, sp he specializes in mentoring and mobile development overall and and that's one of the like things i really like about his stuff is because he does a lot of accelerator shows for me on notes and nine and and today's another uh accelerator show and i like when you can get out of the box and you see other technologies and and things like that so today he's going to come on he's going to talk about um uh, uh, listen event hand event listening handlers or or something like that inside of Accelerator. And again, he's had previous shows on Accelerator Notes tonight. If you wanted to go back to refer to those uh, as a starting point, I, I find them fascinating myself because again, I like seeing the the how other people live. Uh, so with all that being said, let's go to the demo. Hi everyone and welcome. I'm John Jardine from Ukavuma, and in today's video, I'm gonna show you how to bubble up event listeners to improve performance in your Accelerator mobile applications. So in front of me I have a very basic mobile application. I've got a single window that inside contains a table view and inside the table view 20 rows of which each row has a label, a field and a button assigned to it. If we take a look at the code that makes up this uh, mobile application you'll see that inside the index.xml we've got the window with a class of container which is, just, uh, which is actually standard as part of the design. And we've added a table view with an ID of table view main, and we've just set uh, the top so that it uh, spaces 20, 20 pixels from the, uh, from the top. We also then, in the index.js, which you can find under controllers, we have a function that I've created, which generates the 20 rows for the table view. We do a simple for loop that will, um, that will run about 20 times, or that will run 20 times, and for each loop, it will go and create a table view row, provided a title of row X. And inside that, we'll also go and create a button with a, label, a title of button, uh, assign it to the table row. We've also got a field over here, and we, we give it a text of field X, give some basic um, properties to make up the field, and we also add that to the table row. So you'll see again in the table row, here's the field, he has the title of the row itself and he has the button on the right hand side. What we've done as well is we've gone and added an event listener, a click event listener to the button as well as the table row. We've then gone and added a return event listener to the field as well as a blue event listener to the field. And if I go back to the mobile app and start clicking, we will see um, we will see these event listeners in action. And all I'm doing is I do alerts to show uh, which event listeners are triggered and what the outcome of that event listener is. So if we go to the mobile app and I go and click on any one of the rows, you'll see over here that it says I am row zero. And if I click on row five, you'll see it's I am row five. If I click on this button over here, it will say I am button zero. 
and you'll actually notice that the alert pops up twice and I'll explain that in a moment. If I go to any one of these fields and I start on the one and then try and click onto the next field, you'll notice that blur is triggered for field zero. Blur is then triggered for field one because we wanted to enter field one. And if I hit enter on the keyboard, it will trigger the return. And you'll see return is triggered for field one. Blur is, uh, blur is then triggered for field one because it's moving out. And yeah, so you have an idea of the event listeners that are currently running on, uh, on this window. Now the problem over here is if we go to the code and we see, okay, fine, for every iteration uh, in this loop, we've got four event listeners that get added at any point in time. Now the problem here is take four multiplied by 20 and you've got 80 event listeners that are running in, the, uh, in this window alone. And this might be a pretty silly example, um, and, and, and people might not really go this far when it comes to adding event listeners, but I do believe I make my case, and that in general practice, many will find that a lot of event listeners are running in any one of their windows at any time, uh, and, and, and what a lot of people might not realize is that the more event listeners added to your uh, mobile application, the, the bigger the performance knock of your mobile application. And I have seen this in action live at clients where, um, where the event listeners just became the bane of my existence. Now, the good news is that there is a way around it to decrease the amount of event listeners. And in my example, we can dr dr drastically decrease the amount of event listeners and still provide the same results in terms of what gets clicked and what gets alerted. So let's go to the code again. If we go and just reference the click events, all right? As a default for most controls, in fact, as a default for any control in Accelerator Mobile, it's got a property that called bubble parent. And that property has a default value of true. And what it means is it will take the event of the button and it will bubble up to its parent control if that parent control is in fact listening for that event. And I'll give you a good example over here. For the button, we have a click event, and on the table row, we have a click event. Now remember earlier on, when I clicked on the button, it actually prompted twice. And there we go again. The reason for that is because, number one, the first prompt occurred as a result of this event listener that we assigned directly to the, click, uh, to the button. But because the table row also had a click event listener, it triggered the same, um, it triggered the same uh, event, uh, but, but on a higher level on the table row, which means that if I remove this event listener and comment it out, what just happened? So I no longer have the event listener on the button, but I have it on the table row. And if I save and I rebuild the application, I can click on any one of these buttons and I still have the event listener triggered. And notice now that it only triggers once. So the point that I'm making over here is that you don't need to add an event listener to every control if its parent can provide the same uh, capability and, have, uh, and, and listen for the click event to, to give you what you're looking for. So over here it was a good example. We now don't have an event listener on the uh, button anymore, but we do have an event listener on the table row. So we've already eliminated 20 listeners on our window just by removing this code. Yet we still have a handle on these buttons and we can still trigger the code. So what we want to do is we want to take it a step further. We'll say, okay, fine. Um, what if we had to what if we had to add the event listener? against our table view and not necessarily against each table row. So if we go to the table view and we say, okay, fine, we want to add an on click event over here. If I take a look at the code here, I created a very simple function called table view click event. And all it does is it, it will print, it will do an alert and it will print out the object that makes up the, um, what was triggered. So we can see what we have a handle on when this event is triggered. So I'm going to go over here to the table view and I'm going to say on click 
is equal to, well, that didn't work, on click is equal to, and I'm going to run this fun uh, function table view click event. And what I'm also going to do is I'm going to remove now the table row event listener click event. So let's save this and preview it. So what I want to do now is I want to test the click events against the table row as well as the buttons because these are the two event listeners that I've disabled for each of those items and hope, hoping that the table view itself will get a handle on these events uh, that, are, that are being triggered. So if I click over here, you'll see that now I'm getting a full printout of the entire object. And what this is telling me is that this, this function over here, table view click event, is being triggered. But if we take a look at the details of this object that's getting printed out, we'll see that the type of event that occurred, uh, occurred is click. And more importantly, notice what the title is bringing through, row zero. So in this case, the table view knows that we clicked on the row. And this is how we can get a handle on it. So that's a very good start. It means that we've eliminated a further 20 event listeners um, on our window and we're still getting the same result back. So if I go and click on the button now, you'll notice that it's still providing a full output which tells us that the table view event listener is being triggered, which, is, which makes sense because we no longer have now a click event for the button that's being listened directly against the button or against the table row. It's being listened against the table view. And if we take a look, we can see over here the type was a click event. We're happy with that. And it's showing us the row that, uh, the, the row that was triggered, which is fine. But more importantly, if you take a look at the source object, you'll see that the title says button zero. So now we know that, um, and this is what tells us that we actually triggered the button and not necessarily the row. Whereas if we click on the row earlier on, you'll notice that the source is the row and not the button anymore. So with a little bit of logic inside this function, we can get a handle on every row that is triggered as well as every button that is triggered and all from one event listener. So now that means that instead of 80 event listeners, we left with 20 plus 20 is 40 plus the initial one. So now we're left with 41 event listeners. So that's already a drop of 39 event listeners on our window. And that, that's double the performance um, that that you won't see here because I'm running on a machine, but that's, that's pretty much double the performance of your mobile application already. But we can take it a step further and we can see, okay, fine. Can we trigger the return or the blur events on our table view? Now, the one thing to note about, uh, about this is that your parent controls cannot trigger every kind of event listener. Okay, And the good example over here is the return and the blur events. I'm gonna, in my example, what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and see if I can catch the blur event as well as the return event of the field directly from the table view. So if I go here and I say um, on blur is equal to run that same event, uh, run that same function, and on return is equal to run that same function. If I save this, and I go here and I disable these events so that they no longer run. Let's see what the outcome is. Okay, so let's first test if the row is triggered. There we go. The type is click and the title is row zero. So we know that the row was triggered. If we click on the button, uh, the type is click and the title is button zero. So we know that the button was triggered. And now let's go to a field. So if I click on this field and I move from one field to the next field, nothing happens. All right. Uh, but if I click on this, if I hit the enter on this field, notice what happens. The type return. So in other words, the return event was triggered against this. And if we look at the source, it gives us back the, um, the field that was triggered. And there should be a title here somewhere. Oh, text. There we go. Text field one which makes sense because there we go, that's text field X. And that tells us that the field inside the row was triggered. And it also tells us that the table view 
was able to trigger a return event. Although, unfortunately, it's not able to trigger a blur event. So, in some cases, and this comes back to what I said earlier on, um, certain parent controls can only trigger certain events. Now, the other interesting part is that even though uh, the table view was unable to process the blur event, it almost felt like that made sense because if we take a look at the type ahead, The type, uh, the, the, the type ahead tells us that there is in fact no uh, blur event. So that would have made sense. But also notice that the type ahead tells us that the table view doesn't have any return event listener. And what, what, what's interesting is that the return event was still triggered against these fields. So even though an event listener for certain control doesn't exist, um, it doesn't necessarily mean it cannot be triggered in order to accommodate a child control, in our case, the return event. And what this means is that in our example, we unfortunately still have to manually trigger the blur event uh, against the field itself. But um, on, the, on the bright side, we've got uh, th three other event types that we could move directly to the table view parent, which gives us a total of 21 event listeners that we need to add to our window as opposed to the 80 that we initially added. So I trust this gives everyone an idea of, of, of where we're going with this and the kind of performance uh, uh, the, uh, a boost that you can give your mobile application. I hope that this example did make sense and while it was a silly example it proved my point of how we can um, really improve performance on, on mobile apps and eliminate unnecessary uh, listeners and also lessen the amount of code that one needs to write at the end of the day. So I hope this was uh, valuable to everyone. Until next time, enjoy. And that's the demo. I thank John for coming on and I, I look forward to his return. If you have any questions for me, here's my information and I thank you for your time.